Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about pulmonary embolism. So, embolism which is going to the lungs. That is the meaning of this word, pulmonary embolism. So, embolism can originate from anywhere in the body, especially in the lower legs, lower limbs. From there, that pulmonary embolism will go to the lungs. Because uh, the circulation goes like that then it will go to the heart. So, in lungs, in circulation, it will block. So, suppose a main artery is blocked here, the circulation which is uh, going to other areas of the lungs also will be completely blocked. So, lung will not get any blood supply. Okay, That is pulmonary embolism. Now, it indicates the obstruction of pulmonary artery or its branches it can be due to thrombus so thrombus can be originated uh, somewhere near to the pulmonary artery or from distant area it can come as an embolism tumor emboli can occur sometimes air can occur sometimes because uh, air can be sucked inside to the vein especially in there is when there is a trauma uh, cut injury of arteries all these things in uh, accidents it can occur or accidentally when we are injecting uh, 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 IV fluids and all it can uh, when the IV fluids is over sometimes air can get inside but that all uh, a small uh, uh, small amount of air only will enter that may not produce clinically important embolism uh, otherwise uh, trauma is one of the major uh, factor for air and fat embolism uh, that can originate any part of body and it can go to the circulation so Thrombi originate from the venous thrombi, especially in the lower limb uh, thrombi, can uh, dislodge from the uh, area and go to the uh, uh, pulmonary circulation. You can see here the uh, legs through veins. Suppose there is a thrombi here, it travels through the vein and go to the heart. From the heart, it will go to the lungs. You can trace this, it will go to the lungs. So, in lung, lungs, this thrombi can block anywhere. So, that is a problem. So, it can block anywhere in the uh, circulation in the lungs. That produces pulmonary embolism. You can see here, this artery is blocked here. So, this much area is not getting blood supply. If there is no blood supply to that area, oxygenation of blood will be reduced. Suppose the clot is here. The whole lung will be involved. So there is a there will be a significant area of the uh, lung is involved in the uh, pulmonary embolism. So patient can have acutely patient can have breathlessness. But remember when there is a block in the vein, these blood blood vessels are actually after uh, after complete circulation, it is going to the heart and pumped out. That blood will be pumped out. So if that blood is not able to go to the heart then patient can develop shock also. So in a severe thrombotic uh, lesion, pulmonary embolism, patient can experience uh, shock. That is a problem. Now three types of uh, presentations can be there. Acute pulmonary embolism, suddenly patient develops signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism due to acute obstruction. Subacute means it takes some time. It takes uh, one or two days or weeks. Chronic means chronically patient is developing pulmonary uh, embolism, small small embolism, slowly patient develops pulmonary hypertension, then right ventricular failure, then all features of congestive heart failure. Now, there are a lot of risk factors for pulmonary embolism, many are acquired, some are inherited, we will see inherited first, factor 5 laden mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C and S deficiency, these are the three important conditions here. There are a lot of other conditions also. We don't go to that area now. Now in this uh, risk factor for uh, uh, pulmonary embolism is one of the most important pulmonary um, uh, risk factor is DVT. So from DVT only patient develops pulmonary embolism but all other uh, condition prolonged travel, immobility, obesity, smoking, surgery trauma, uh, hormone replacement therapy or oral contraceptive fill, pills antiphospholipid antibody syndrome malignancy old age all these things ultimately they produce mostly they produce deep vein thrombosis then that deep vein thrombosis produces pulmonary embolism okay 
But suddenly, in the pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein itself, patient can develop thrombos, and that also can produce uh, pulmonary embolism. But uh, the common presentation will be there will be a, a DVT. From that DVT, patient develops pulmonary embolism. Now there are lot of causes for pulmonary embolism. We have already seen that fat embolism, sickle cell anemia, amniotic fluid embolism, tumor cell embolism. Uh, bacteria that is sepsis, septic emboli, hydrated cyst emboli, uh, then foreign material injection can sometimes produce air and gas embolism. That is mainly occurring uh, as a hospital acquired problem. These things are hospital acquired problem. Uh, then this is a physiological condition which produces uh, uh, embolism. In that fracture or trauma, there is a very, very important thing that produces fat embolism. From the large bones, fat embolism can fat embolism can enter to the veins and go to the pulmonary circulation. Now we can see the clinical features, symptoms. There may be history of DVT, sudden chest pain. It is like pleuritic chest pain, cough with hemoptysis, breathlessness, pleuritic pain, syncope. Syncope is mainly due to decreased circulation. The RV is not getting RV or RI is not getting blood. The blood is reduced that from RV, LV is not getting blood. So circulation, then it is circulus, total circulation itself is reduced. That is a problem. Now signs, patient can have tachypnea, hypoxemia, cyanosis, tachycardia, hypotension due to RV failure, elevated JVP, loud P2, acute corporal menu. That is very important. Any, any condition which produces Lung, uh, sorry, uh, right heart failure, uh, whether it is acute or chronic, that is called as corpulmonal. Here, acute corpulmonal, most important cause for acute corpulmonal is uh, pulmonary embolism. Patient can have mild fever also. Mortality rate is very high in pulmonary embolism. Now, you can see here acute pulmonary embolism. You, you can see here there are different uh, after effects uh, due to pulmonary embolism. One of the important problem is RV dilatation because RV is not able to uh, 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 not able to perform properly. So ultimately, it pu pu put pressure on the RV. And all these things uh, uh, as an effect of all these things, patient develops hypotensive shock and some patients can have arrhythmias especially atrial arrhythmias so atrial arrhythmias hypotensive shock hypoxemia are the three important features of pulmonary embolism so hypoxemia hypotension and arrhythmias now like uh, we have seen in uh, deep vein thrombosis here also there is a criteria called as wells criteria and it is modified Wells criteria nowadays because Wells, Wells criteria there are a lot of uh, uh, parameters but uh, however it is useful a very useful uh, scoring system clinical symptoms of DVT three points other diagnostic uh, less likely than pulmonary embolism three points heart rate more than 100 1.5 points immobilization 1.5 points previous DVT pulmonary embolism uh, that is 1.5 points hemoptysis 1 point malignancy 1 point Probability score, we have to see high, high probability, more than 6, moderate, 2 to 6, low, less than 2. Other one is simplified Wells criteria or modified Wells criteria. Simplified or modified Wells criteria. There are only two things, more than 4 or less than 4. In a pulmonary embolism, there is another criteria, rule out criteria, PERC. Pulmonary embolism rule out criteria that includes uh, eight factors age less than 50 years, pulse less than 100 beats, oxygen saturation more than 95 percent, no unilateral leg swelling, no hemoptysis, no surgery trauma within four weeks, no previous DVT pulmonary embolism, no oral hormones. Patients fulfilling all eight criteria is considered as negative for pulmonary embolism. So that is rule out criteria, other one is diagnostic criteria. Both are almost uh, equal and uh, both are good also. Now another important uh, investigation in emergency room will be D-dimer ELISA. D-dimer you know that all types of uh, hemolysis or infarction everywhere it will be elevated. So uh, it's a fibrin breakdown product. 
problem is it can be elevated in so many conditions like myocardial infarction pulmonary embolism sepsis pneumonia uh, pleuritis everywhere it will be involved but uh, when it is negative suppose you are suspecting pulmonary embolism and d dimer is negative then it is a good rule out criteria like if d dimer is negative in a suspected case of pulmonary embolism that rules out pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism so it is a negative uh, marker so uh, d dimer can be negative abg since patient is having tachy tachypnea patient can have uh, reduc reduction in the co2 even when the patient is having tachypnea there is less oxygenation so oxygen also reduced so it's a type 1 respiratory failure along with respiratory alkalosis that that is because pco2 washout occurs PO2 is reduced, PCO2 wash out occurs. Afterwards, slowly PCO2 build up occurs. ECG normally, this type of patients can have sinus tachycardia, and that is the most important, most common finding in any patient who is having pulmonary embolism. Some patients can have atrial tachyarrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation is common. RBBB, RVH can also be there. But there will be something called as S1, Q3, T3. That is a classical change. But it is not at all common. It is not very common in case of pulmonary embolism. But once you see this S1, Q3, T3, then that is an indication for pulmonary embolism. So here you can see S1, Q3, T3. There is a deep S wave. So you can see here in the lead one, S is deep. Negative complex is deep. So S1. Then you take lead 3. Q3. Q3 means there is a significant Q wave. So, first wave negative wave is a Q wave. So, Q wave. Then there is a, so there is a Q wave. Then T wave inversion. That is in lead 3. So, S1, deep S1 in lead 1, Q3, Q wave in lead 3 and T3. S1, Q3, T3. So, this is a classical finding seen in pulmonary embolism, but not very common in cases with pulmonary embolism. Now, chest X-ray shows two important signs that you should remember. One is Westermark sign, oligemia of lung field. That means when the pulmonary embolism occurs for an artery, normally you get uh, blood vessels like this. Okay. So in the lung, you can uh, artery will be there, main artery will be there, that will be white in color. Then from there, uh, circulating arteries can be or branches can be there like a tree. But that will be, uh, that also will be white in color. But what happens in pulmonary embolism, that there will be absence of these arteries. So from up to this artery, you can trace white color. After that, there is no circulation. So that is oligemic lung fields. So that is Westermark sign. So here you can see artery is present here, but after that there is no blood vessel. Okay, all are, but here you can see lot of blood vessels are there. So that is Westermark sign. Other one is wedge shaped pulmonary opacities above the diaphragm, that is Hampton sum. So uh, you can see here it is something like a consolidation, that part consolidation, Westermark sign. Sorry, Hampton sign. Pleural effusion can be there since it is an in uh, inflammatory condition. Pleural effusion can be there. Sometimes the pulmonary artery will be uh, enlarged because one, once it is blocked, so before blocking it will get en enlarged, engorged. Now echo is another important finding because uh, most of the time you may not see anything in the X-ray, but echo will be very useful in emergency room. Increased RV size is one of the important finding you get in massive pulmonary embolism and uh, it is not seen in small small pulmonary embolism. In a massive pulmonary embolism, RV size, size is uh, increased. McConnell sign, regional wall motion abnormalities that spare the right ventricular apex. So, regional wall motion abnormality can be there that spare the right ventricular apex you can see here. Tricuspid regurgitation can be there. Abnormal septal wall motion, RV free wall hypokinesia and interventricular septal flattering, uh, flattening can be there. 
right heart thrombus can also be there sometimes ventilation perfusion scan is a very important investigation in uh, pulmonary embolism but nowadays uh, we are not uh, d routinely depending on that uh, the advantage of this test is if we are not able to do any other test like uh, you are not able to do uh, ct pulmonary angiogram due to any reason uh, non availability this may be very useful the problem here is ventilation perfusion match mismatch means in a lung field if you are if you are with this is a nuclear medicine investigation so the blood vessel will be there so this area is take suppose this is a pulmonary embolism area this area ventilation is normal like air is coming and going out there is no problem in ventilation but perfusion is blocked so there is no blood vessel uh, this one so ventilation perfusion if you see in pulmonary embolism ventilation is normal perfusion is abnormal perfusion is not there whereas in pneumonia perfusion is normal ventilation is abnormal so that is the difference between pneumonia uh, that is consolidation and pulmonary embolism pulmonary embolism ventilation is normal perfusion is reduced that is uh, ventilation perfusion mismatching now mdct chest can be done doppler of the leg veins are very important doppler you can rule out dvt ct pulmonary angiogram is the gold standard test for pulmonary uh, embolism that has to be done so you can see here ct angiogram showing multiple pulmonary artery filling defects so you can see here filling defects so this much area is not perfused properly so that is filling defect that uh, consists of uh, pulmonary embolism here also you can see the thrombus so ventilation perfusion scan we have seen that uh, previously ventilation perfusion perfusion scan can be done in patients uh, uh, who cannot uh, go for uh, any type of CT angiogram. So normally in emergency room we do uh, in, uh, one ECG, then we do go for ultrasound, uh, uh, ultrasound chest and ultrasound uh, leg that is Doppler uh, this one. Then CT angiogram is the uh, investigation of choice to uh, diagnose or rule out pulmonary embolism. So this chart shows how to evaluate this type of patients we have already explained it in detail so i am not going to the evaluation part now 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 we have to see what is the cause for uh, pulmonary embolism if there is a definitive cause like we have seen like prolonged travel long bed rest previous surgeries uh, something like that we can uh, see that is a reason for that but here there are some reasons uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, genetical or uh, uh, modified uh, reasons that should be evaluated you can uh, if there is no other identifiable cause you have to check for antiphospholipid antibodies homocysteine levels uh, pnh you have to rule out protein c protein s level can, should be done but i'll tell what is the problem here antithrombin 3 is another this one factor uh, 5 uh, pcr prothrombin 20210 mutation testing in this uh, two investigation we should not try to do in the first stage of the pulmonary embolism because any embolism in our body body will try to lyse it so lot of protein c protein s antithrombin will be utilized for that thrombus and its lysis so the levels will be acutely low in any acute thrombus or acute dvt so if you do this test and may brand the patient as protein C, protein S deficiency, that may not be clinically correct. So you, you can do the test, you can document it, but don't make a decision according to, to this test that protein C, protein S deficiency is there or antithrombin deficiency is there. That is because whenever there is an acute thrombus, the formation of thrombus and lysis of the thrombus will occur in our body. So all this protein S, protein C and antithrombin will be utilized in that condition. So even if you get a lower levels, that doesn't mean that patient is actually having a problem there. But you have to document that if the levels are good, then no need to investigate uh, this uh, condition afterwards. If the levels are low, then you have to give some time. Afterwards, you have to rule out after six months, after stopping warfarin actually or any other oral uh, anticoagulant drug you have to 
rule out this condition after 6 months or 9 months once you stop it. Now initial management in emergency room because these patients will come to emergency room you have to take care airway, breathing, circulation, oxygen has to be given. Morphine can be given but remember morphine has a side effect, adverse effects. It can produce sometimes hypotension. So we have to be very careful. If there is no hypotension or chance of hypotension we can try morphine in smaller doses and build up the dose. Hypertension, again fluids, normal saline can be given. Any type of RV failure, fluids are the choice. And norepinephrine can be added to that. Dobutamine in cardiogenic shock, after starting norepinephrine, then maintain the BP, systolic BP, somewhere around 100 millimeter of mercury, then add dobutamine. Now the most important drug in emergency room, we should start if the patient is not going for uh, embolectomy or uh, pro, uh, other type of uh, uh, thrombolysis, heparin. Heparin, we will see the dose afterwards. So heparin or uh, thrombolysis or uh, embolectomy, these are the options. Now heparin is given as 80 units per kg, continuous infusion 100 units per hour, that in 18 units per kg per hour, monitor APTT. 5 days should be given or you can go for low molecular weight heparin. Anoxaparin is a uh, drug nowadays we use for all patients. Other drugs also there, 1.5 milligram per kg daily for 5 days. Remember, if the creatinine is elevated, go for only uh, regular heparin. Fondoparinax is another drug which can also be tried instead of heparin. Then along with the heparin, we have to start warfarin because warfarin, heparin starts immediately but warfarin takes time to act. So it takes minimum 7 days. So till then you have to cover with heparin, then continue on warfarin or whatever drug you may start. Start along with heparin, average size patient 5 mg per day you can give. In obese patient 7.5 to 10 mg you can give. Malnourished 2.5 mg, keep INR around 2.5. That is very important. Now thrombolytic therapy. If the patient is having severe pulmonary embolism, shock, all these things, better try for uh, thrombolytic therapy, streptokinase, urokinase, tissue plasminogen, activator, all these things can be tried. But nowadays we go for this regime, tissue plasminogen activator. But streptokinase also can be given. This is the same drug which is used in myocardial infarction, stroke and all. Thrombolytic therapy, massive pulmonary embolism, uh, or patient present with uh, hemodynamic instability, tissue plasminogen activator, can be started. Embolectomy can be tried in patients with hemodynamically unstable pulmonary embolism in whom thrombolytic therapy is contraindicated. It is also therapeutic option those who fail thrombolysis. So we have discussed about one of the important conditions that is pulmonary embolism. Not, uh, uh, more, not all pulmonary embolism is an emergency. Many pulmonary embolisms are chronic they present as chronic core pulmonary like COPD or ILD. You may miss the diagnosis. Uh, but acute pulmonary embolism is always evident. Patient is acutely breathless, hypotension, but X-ray may be completely normal. On auscultation also, you may not get, get any finding. But CT pulmonary angiogram is the investigation of choice. Echo will help you in emergency room to make a probable diagnosis. There are, there are charts you have seen that uh, uh, Wells criteria or pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. They, they all will help you to um, diagnose or rule out probability of pulmonary embolism in emergency room. Heparin or tissue plasminogen activator are the treatment of choice. Thank you.